on this edition of Exposé, Long Buried Secrets. Brad took them and put them in an isolated tent way away from the rest of the staff. And it wasn't hours before he showed up and tried to molest those boys. Unearthed by the hometown newspaper. When I read that, I thought, okay, this is starting to smell like a cover up. Funding for Expose has been provided by In a small town in Idaho, a father remembers the day his family's life changed. This is a moment I will never forget uh, forever. But as my boys walked past me, I said, how was scout camp? And neither one of them looked at me. They just kept their heads down and said, we're not supposed to tell you what happened. Austin with the Post Register Minute. These are the top stories we're working on for tomorrow's paper. A three foot Cayman crocodile is quarantined at the Tapas Park Zoo after it was captured Saturday at a home along County Line Road. It's a small paper, but we don't think small, is how I best describe it. The Post Register serves Idaho Falls, Idaho, a town of about 50,000. People describe this as Mayberry. Every town has its mythology about itself, and I think people are really attached to that mythology here. We're just gonna let it go. That would be the paper's executive editor is Dean Miller. There probably aren't a lot of American newspaper editors who can go fly fishing five minutes from their house and work for a great little, you know, independent paper. And that's a minnow pattern, but I hate to resort to that. I'm not much of a wet fly fisherman. I'm a dry fly guy. So I'm going to try this little brown hummer, see what he does. Idaho Falls is the complete opposite of any place I ever thought I would end up. There isn't like a hit bar that I'm aware of. I mean, I guess there is a bar, but it's not a hit bar. Reporter Peter Zuckerman didn't come to Idaho Falls for the nightlife. He came because of the Post Register's reputation for letting young journalists take on ambitious stories. He was put on a traditional rookie beat, covering cops and courts. I'm doing pretty well. How are you? And, and you know, I knew everybody at that courthouse. I knew, you know, I knew the janitor. I knew the daughter of the secretary. What happened to her? The clerks in the courthouse, he did this funny story on a cow that got loose. And by then, some of the clerks in the courthouse had sort of taking a shine to Peter, and so they bought him this little stuffed cow that was on his desk. When you start seeing that kind of stuff, you know you've got a reporter who is building a source network. Soon Zuckerman's source network was quietly hinting at something peculiar. Certain court records seemed to have disappeared into thin air. Every once in a while, there'd just be some sort of offhand comment that was like, yeah, it's one of those other erased cases, those ones that nobody can find out about. So I just kept asking questions because whenever somebody says, you know, you don't want to go there, I think that's where I should be going. After months and months of asking, you know, what's up with these missing cases? This clerk finally says, you know, I really, I can't tell you about this, but I know somebody who can. We tried to find an arrangement where I can meet with this person's friend, where no one else will be around. Zuckerman was told to wait alone at midnight 
on the outskirts of town. And when he told me, I was like, you don't do that. You know, that's a big risk. You, you go, but you tell somebody that you're going or you carry a cell phone turned on so that I can listen and if something happens, I can be there immediately, but he just went. Finally, this car pulls up and I can't really tell who it is. It's, it's pretty dark. The figure is all bundled up and I'm, I'm trying to be all nice and friendly and I say, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Peter Zuckerman from the Post Register. Tell me a little bit about this. No answer. Can, can you, you know, what, what can I do? You know, I'm, I'm really curious about this. No, still no answer. And then she you know, digs around in her pocket or somehow comes up with this little pink sticky note and just hands it to me. And then she starts to run. So I, I get this pink sticky note and it has these numbers on it. And, and at least at the time, savvy enough to notice that this is probably a court case because you can tell from the arrangement of the numbers. I type in the, the, the numbers and then the, the computer beeps and out comes this message that says case not found. Looking for answers, Zuckerman went to the court clerk. He was handed a document that astonished him, a judge's sealing order. And it says something along the lines of, this is a case that involves the Boy Scouts of America. All traces of this case are to be hidden from the public and the news media. And I'm looking at this, and I mean, I'm just thinking, what the heck is this? And then another court official comes by and rips it out of my hand and says, this is not for you to see. I hate it when reporters write themselves into the story. But at that point, Peter was a part of the story. And it was an explosive story. Mining his source network further, he found out the sealed Boy Scout case involved pedophilia. In 1997, a former scout leader named Brad Stowell had pleaded guilty to two counts of sexual abuse of a minor. That was no secret. But in 2003, a family had filed a civil suit involving Stowell against both the local scouts and the Boy Scouts of America. That suit was what someone was trying to hide. The Boy Scout oath says, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. That oath is taken seriously in Idaho Falls, where the majority of people belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Here, the partnership the LDS Church and the Boy Scouts of America have enjoyed since 1913 is treasured. In a fundraising appeal for the Scouts, a church official wrote that it counts on them to, quote, help us train our young men and instill in them the values that we hold sacred. I have been a member of the LDS Church since birth. I'm a staunch believer, and in this area of the country, the LDS Church sponsors many units of the Boy Scouts, and I believe in what the Scouts uh, stands for. Stephen Wright, an Idaho Falls attorney, represents the Post Register. The paper turned to him to try and get the sealed civil suit unsealed. What made this extraordinary was even when a case is sealed, you know it exists. And what really got our attention is to be told, um, we can't even tell you if this case exists, and then to find out that the case that may or may not exist is a case involving uh, children who have been molested. In late 2004, Wright filed a motion on the paper's behalf to unseal the case. But the small town lawyer quickly found himself outgunned. Two prominent Idaho law firms were working on behalf of their clients to keep the file sealed. They were hired by the Boy Scouts of America and the local affiliate which oversees scouting in the region, the Grand Teton Council. One of the responses, I believe they filed uh, the day before Christmas, 
and it attacked the post register pretty directly, not the arguments we were making to unseal, but that the post register was just trying to be sensational. At that point, I knew that we had a major battle on our hands, and I certainly knew we weren't going to back down. The legal back and forth lasted months, stretching the small paper's resources. Finally, the judge ruled unequivocally for the post register. The case was unsealed. But there was more. Zuckerman managed to obtain a second vanished civil suit from the court. This one filed against the Scouts and the Grand Teton Council in 1999. Now, Dean Miller and his wife Tracy, a former paralegal, would spend hour upon hour trying to make sense of thousands of pages of documents, all about the Brad Stowell cases. It was like opening Pandora's box. We just turned something over, and every five minutes, less than that, like every minute and a half, have you seen this? Oh my God! And then he'd look over, listen to this, you know? Because yeah. it just, the more you got into it, the more you're thinking, no wonder they didn't want anybody to see this stuff. It's worse than you yeah. could have imagined it was. The testimony described many more than the two victims Stoll had pleaded guilty to molesting. And in his own sworn testimony, Brad Stoll graphically described the molestations. Editor Dean Miller and reporter Peter Zuckerman were particularly intrigued by the story of two brothers victimized by Brad Stoll. Miller asked Zuckerman to pay a visit to their father, Paul Steed, at the time, a teacher at an LDS church seminary. Oh, this is Adam and Benjamin. This was taken uh, within just a few months of, you know, when they went up to scout camp. And it's kind of tough when you see them at the age that they really were. Paul Steed remembers how he coaxed the story of the fateful events of 1997 out of his sons. We had an old van out in the driveway, and I said, let's just sit down for a little while. Let's get in this van and just roll the windows down and just talk. And I said, first of all, nobody has a right to tell you to keep something from your parents, and whoever told you that was wrong. And both of the boys broke into tears, and they sobbed uncontrollably for a long time. Camp Little Lemhi is in a pristine area of Idaho near the Grand Teton Mountains and Yellowstone National Park. And for 15-year-old Adam Steed, that summer should have been a proud one. By his dad's account, he was a few badges away from the rank of Eagle Scout, and the camp's esteemed programs director had taken him under his wing. That was Brad Stowell. And as the paper would report, Stoll was finding ways to be alone with Adam Steed and putting his hands where they shouldn't be. Later that summer, Adam was joined at camp by his younger brother. Brad took them and put them in an isolated tent way away from the rest of the staff. And it wasn't hours before he showed up and tried to molest those boys. And they're so worried that Stoll is going to come after them that they spend extra time in the evening tying their tent together and, and being protected. And they try to stay up and take, take turns so that he can't, you know, come to their tent. The older son woke up in the middle of the night. He looked over to where his little brother's supposed to be, and his bed and him are gone. Stoll had come in and did their tent and slowly, slowly drug that, that bed outside. And our younger son woke up because he couldn't breathe. And Stoll's hand was over his mouth and, and Stoll was trying to molest him. Then something happened that really opened this up. And that is Adam was walking along and he had a necklace on that Brad Stoll had given him. And another staffer said, where did you get that necklace from? He said, I'll bet you got that from Brad Stoll. And he said, well, how did you know that? He says, he gives those necklaces to all the boys he molests. He said, 
look, they're all over the camp. Now, Adam Steed did something courageous. He spoke to other scouts he suspected were being molested and confirmed that he was not alone. Armed with a list of scouts that Stoll was abusing, he confronted the camp director, Elias Lopez. He says Lopez promised to investigate, and Lopez did interview Brad Stoll, who denied the allegations. Paul Steed remembers his son Adam's account of what Elias Lopez then told him. He said, I know for a fact that Brad goes into tents with kids. He sometimes takes them out in the woods and he does that. But he's the best leader we've got in this camp. He helps kids right and left. And Brad agreed that, you know, he is kind of close with a lot of these kids. And so that if he does occasionally rub their backs, he won't take their shirts off. The scouts take steps to inform kids about the dangers posed by pedophiles. You have the right to control your own body. If you ever feel uncomfortable, say someone is touching you a lot or in places where they shouldn't, well, you as a kid can stop it. I mean, even rudely. Run, scream, make a scene, do anything, and then get help. Experience indicates that a molester could be anybody. The three R's of protection, recognize, resist, and report is the Boy Scouts of America's message to the young people of our society. After Adam Steed recognized and reported to the camp director, Elias Lopez, Lopez called his boss, a man named Kim Hansen. He told Hansen of Adam Steed's accusations and Brad Stoll's denials that there had been sexual contact. So Elias calls Kim Hansen, who is in charge of a 30,000 scout Grand Teton Council, who is presumably the most trained in scouting's youth protection program. And what Elias says under oath is that Kim told him that if there's no skin-to-skin -skin touching, there's nothing we can do. Adam Steed returned later that evening with an ultimatum. In this handwritten statement to authorities, Elias Lopez recounted the moment. Adam told me that if we were not going to do anything, he would be forced to tell his parents. This is when I called Kim Hansen to let him know that the problem was more serious than expected. It wasn't until the next afternoon that Bonneville County Sheriff's deputies arrived and arrested Brad Stoll. Scouting was, is an incredibly precious memory to me. You know, it was boyhood, all that freedom and, and and to hear that these awful things had happened at scout camp, I mean, it's just the, the stories are, are awful. But in order to do the story, I had to be able to get some distance from time to time, and this is a great way to do it. Dean Miller and Peter Zuckerman weren't done mining the once secret court files. They used them, as well as other sources, to put together a Brad Stowell timeline. In 1988, the 16-year-old Stoll admitted to his mother, Judith, herself a Cub Scout leader, and to his Mormon bishop, Lauren Talbot, that he molested a six-year-old neighbor. The police had questioned Stoll. No charges were filed, but he was sent for six months of church counseling. That same year, he was hired to teach first aid at Camp Little Lemhi, and he would testify he molested a scout for the first time. In 1989, Stoll was hired again by the camp, this time as a waterfront instructor. Between 1991 and 1994, one of Stoll's neighbors, Richard Scarborough, doggedly wrote letters to authorities about Brad Stoll. And Richard Scarborough is writing letters to Boy Scout leadership, church officials who sponsor Boy Scout troops, and then high church officials, like at the Salt Lake City level, saying, this man is a pedophile. He should not be a scout leader. 
During that period, Stoll was rehired several times at Camp Little Lemhi. He also was sent on a Mormon mission to Alaska, where he later admitted to molesting a child. In 1993, Stoll's mother Judith became an executive board member of the Grand Teton Council. In 95, an anonymous phone tip to the council stating that Stoll posed a threat to young scouts spurred it to investigate. But Brad Stoll insisted he was over his problems, and the paper would report his Mormon bishop, Lauren Talbot, said he saw no reason Stoll couldn't be in scouting. Everybody who was confronted with this decision, do we take a chance on Brad Stoll? They all erred on the side of Brad Stoll, not the safety of the kids. In 1996, Stoll was promoted to programs director at Camp Little Lemhi. He continued to prey on scouts. He wasn't arrested for a molestation until 1997. He pleaded guilty to two counts of sexually abusing two scouts at Little Lemhi and was sentenced to a minimum of two and a maximum of 14 years in jail. But he only served 150 days. The rest of his sentence was suspended and he was put on probation. In 1999, in civil suit testimony, Stoll would confess that he had molested, quote, about 24 children. For at least four years, the Post Register would report, the scouts had access to that testimony. In a sworn statement, a plaintiff's lawyer quoted a scout's attorney as saying in 2001, the scouts did not wish to, quote, open old wounds by contacting the victim's parents. I really wanted the story, you know, with scout leadership telling us why they handled it the way they did. Maybe they knew something we didn't know. And they would not answer questions. They would not explain themselves. They wouldn't explain the things they said in depositions. But while Grand Teton Council officials refused to sit for interviews, they were offering a comment on the record. The scouts issued a release calling the stories lies yeah. before the stories were printed, before they were published, before anyone had seen them. In the post Register newspaper articles starting Sunday, February 27th, which were not out yet, this was sent, I think, like the Friday before, the council has or will come under fire for alleged actions or inactions. We assert these claims are simply not true. They haven't read the claims. When I read that, I thought, Okay, this is starting to smell like a cover-up. By early 2005, Peter Zuckerman and Dean Miller's series was ready for print. Titled Scout's Honor, it appeared in February and ran for six days. You just don't know how people are going to react. I mean, I've been in this business long enough to know that you can have a story about a dance team and people will get totally upset about it. Or you have another story and no one's upset about it. But on this one, I knew it because it questioned two things that people here really like. It questioned religious authority and the Boy Scouts. Indeed, a backlash was brewing, though perhaps not exactly the kind expected by the newspaper or by the young reporter who had stumbled onto the provocative story that had set the events in motion. My boss, Dean, calls me on the phone. He's talking quickly. He says, Peter, this is the call I hope they never had to make. And he says, you know, people are going to go after you personally for this story. And they have said that they're going to do what they can to make your life miserable. And I said, oh, well, thanks for letting me know. And it's true, that's what happened.
funding for expose has been provided by